Good afternoon. For me, it's always good to be in the presence of another historian, but it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Ronald C. White, Jr. with us today at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. As those of you who are here for this morning's lecture know firsthand, Dr. White is wise and gracious, and his research is compelling. Dr. White is a fellow at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. He is Professor Emeritus of American Religious History at San Francisco Theological Seminary. He's a graduate of UCLA, of Princeton Theological Seminary, and he holds a PhD in Religion and History from Princeton University. Dr. White's 2009 book, A. Lincoln, a biography was a New York Times, a Washington Post, and a Los Angeles Times bestseller. Reviews praise that book as impressive, compelling, brilliant, splendid, superb, thoughtful, provocative, remarkable, and moving. Of the biography, the eminent American religious historian Mark Knoll, professor of history, at the University of Notre Dame said this, Ronald White, an acknowledged expert on the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, has now taken in hand a full-length biography. To this task, he brings careful reading, patient attention to context, and special sensitivity to complex questions about Lincoln's religion that characterized his earlier books. Even as that book first appeared, Knoll predicted that the result is a first-rate study that will probably be the biography of the Lincoln Bicentennial year. Dr. White is the author of seven other books, including Lincoln's Greatest Speech, the Second Inaugural, and The Eloquent President, a portrait of Lincoln through his words. Ron White's current work is a comprehensive biography of Ulysses S. Grant. Titled American Ulysses, the book will be published next year by Random House. One of the gifts of Dr. White's research and writing is rooted in his curiosity about the lives of faith of figures who are commonly known for other things. It's a treat to be able to explore this line of thought in his work and here today. We're thrilled to have Dr. White with us at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary to share his research and his insight about Abraham Lincoln's faith journey and our ministry stories. In the first of two lectures this afternoon, Dr. White will impart his wisdom about one of Lincoln's most profound speeches as he shares with us 270 plus two words, the Gettysburg Address. Please join me in welcoming once again, Dr. Ronald C. White, Jr. The question for the afternoon, how many of you have memorized the Gettysburg Address as a young person? Wow. It's pretty age-related. <laughs> I'm looking to see if there's anybody under 50 that raised their hand. Although I am encouraged. I, I, I have talked with teachers, yep, teachers who tell me that they are actually asking children, young people, to memorize the Gettysburg Address. We could have a profound conversation about whatever happened to memorization, memorization of scripture, memorization of the Gettysburg Address. I'm glad you did. I want to begin by thanking the Henderson family for the, their continued generosity in, in allowing this to take place. These sort of lectures just don't materialize out of thin air. Someone has to be behind it to fund it, to make it possible for all of us to have it go on year after year after year. It's been delightful for me to meet old friends and now new friends. I love the fact that we have three lectures. It's a little exhausting, but it's fun in the sense that there can be some conversations that take place, and I've certainly enjoyed them.
at the meal time and, and, and in and between, and we'll do some more but between two and four o'clock, our next presentation. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. I try to suggest in my book, The Eloquent President, that perhaps understandably we wish to focus a person with one address. And so when, if I were to ask the question of many Americans and said Abraham Lincoln, and they might say Gettysburg Address. But I want to use this metaphor. I think Lincoln's speeches are what I call a string of pearls, to use an old uh, Glenn Miller metaphor, <laughs> and that they are of different size, different shape, different colorization, but that we need to see them together. And I hope you will see now as we begin to explore together the Gettysburg Address, that although we have to ask and should ask the question, what are the antecedents? Are there other thinkers that stand behind this address? I will argue that in many ways, the thinker that stands behind this address is Abraham Lincoln that he foreshadows his own address, that he's carrying on an intellectual conversation with himself, and that these addresses kind of move forward. And that's part of my, also my attention to the fact that he is developing as a speaker. I mean, the sadness is that 41 days after he delivers the second inaugural address, he's assassinated. Gamblers in the street have already bet at the second election that he will be elected a third time. There, is no, there are no term limits and that he would serve all the way to March 1873. So the question of what he might have said and might have done is just absolutely incredible. The Gettysburg Address. The address is but 272 words. The little town of Gettysburg with all of its spokes like a wheel is the place where the tremendous battle of the Civil War takes place July 1, 2, 3. And at the end of that battle, there are 50,000 dead, wounded, and missing. And so the idea comes from the governor of Pennsylvania to put in place the first national cemetery. Uh, sadly, before that, soldiers literally were buried where they fell. And the idea that this is a national cemetery means that people will come from all over the United States. Uh, when they come, before they come, people gather up all the things that are on the bodies of these soldiers. Letters, diaries, money, photographs. What I'll say later this afternoon is what they chiefly found were Bibles. Both sides read the same Bible. And so the invitation went out for the greatest speaker of the land, Edward Everett, to deliver the address at Gettysburg. Edward Everett had been the president of Harvard, governor of Massachusetts, minister from the United States to England. He had, was currently traveling the country over several years' time, having already given more than 200 speeches trying to raise money to restore George Washington's Mount Vernon. And so he was obviously the choice for this speech. They wanted him to give it, you all would understand this, when the weather was pretty good, in October. And Edward Everett said, sorry, I won't be ready. <laughs> so that's why the day shifted all the way back to November 19, not a very good day, often in the weather, when they celebrate that event over and over and over annually at Gettysburg. It was only towards the last several weeks that an invitation went out to the President of the United States. Would you come and deliver a few words? What's remarkable to remember, and we wouldn't know this, is that everyone on his cabinet expected Lincoln to turn down the invitation. He turned down all invitations to speak outside of Washington. He traveled once to West Point to visit with Winfield Scott, the uh, former general in chief of the army, and he traveled down to Sharpsville, Maryland, when to be with the troops who had suffered and been involved in the decisive battle at Antietam. But they didn't expect him to accept the invitation. It, it doesn't seem that far today to go from Washington to Gettysburg, but in those days it took three different trains. And many politicians, even newspaper people, never got there on time. So they were very surprised that he accepted the invitation. Now, if I had four lectures to give to you, I would have told you why, <laughs> in the sense that that previous summer, 
uh, as the war went on and on and on and on, there was a great tiring of this terrible war. We used to think that the war cost 620,000 dead. That was the official figure for way more than 100 years. And about five years ago, a young demographer got thinking about this and said, I'm not sure, well, what's the basis of that figure? So he compared the census data of 1870 to the census data of 1860 with all of these soldiers, most of whom were young men, and he raised the rate, he raised the, 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 the figure, and we all accept it now. It wasn't 620,000, it was 750,000 dead in a tiny nation of but 30 to 40 million. I don't know about you, but I have to admit, I don't know anybody who has been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. If those figures would be translated to today, it would have been as if there were six million people killed in that war. World War II was 405,000, but the Civil War was 750,000. So Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania put in place a plan to have a national military cemetery, and uh, Edward Everett was invited, and towards the last moment, Abraham Lincoln was invited. Abraham Lincoln arrives as he often wanted to do early. He wanted to understand, he wanted to talk with some of the wives and mothers and fathers of who had lost their sons or husbands. He took a trip by buckboard out with William Seward out on the battlefield that morning so he could further appreciate what this was all about. He actually, as he always did, he revised his address the night before. In the book, The Eloquent President, you will notice that there's a long appendix showing you various versions of this address. Again, the point, Lincoln was not simply a great writer, he was a great rewriter. And so he rewrote the Gettysburg Address after being on the spot to try to understand the pathos of it and to put his final wording into place. Let's look at it together. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We're used to this wonderful phrase and we'll comment in a moment on why it is so magnificent, but we need to recall that Lincoln had offered somewhat the same idea in very, very different words just a few months previous. When the word came in of the victory at Gettysburg and then finally the victory, it took a while for word to get there at Vicksburg, General Grant's great victory, on July 7, people came to the White House to serenade Abraham Lincoln. He didn't do too well often when he spoke spontaneously and with great emotion on that particular afternoon, he said these words, how long ago was it? 80 odd years? Since on the 4th of July, for the first time in the history of the world, a nation and its representatives assembled and declared a self-evident truth, all men are created equal. Well, we wouldn't be quoting that today. <laughs> but my point is this that I think that was in Lincoln's mind and head. It was certainly in the speech that he delivered that day. And so four months later, he comes out with something quite different, far more poetic, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent. Notice his use of the word our. He's identifying himself with the audience. We're all in this together. These are all our fathers. And this is a characteristic way that he speaks. He's not speaking above or to, he's speaking with the people. Now the words have a remarkable, what we might call assonance, the same sort of sound, four score. It, it, it rings on the ear and Lincoln was a master at this. I learned only after I wrote my first Lincoln book that he had a particular habit of writing. I think it's a great habit. I think we've forgotten it today. Lincoln would often say the word out loud before he put it on paper. He would say it out loud so that he could get the sound of the word and then he put it on paper. And that's why there's such wonderful alliteration, there's such wonderful assonance, all of these great characteristics of Lincoln. I should say something all about, also about his elementary, so to speak, education. 
the major grammar book he read, he didn't read until he was 23 years old. And it was a book, in the preface it said, this is a book for juveniles. Well, I'd like today's juveniles to read that book. But the book was divided into two parts. This is an extra credit question. I'm going to ask you just in a second here. The second part was called declamation. Can anybody tell me what declamation is? It's public speaking. And so the second half of the book were selections from the Bible, selections from Shakespeare, selections from Lord Byron, selections from Robert Burns, and the young student was asked to read out loud. Have you ever had this experience in your church where you've asked a young person to read scripture or to speak and you sort of hold your breath and wonder what's going to happen? I spoke on Tuesday at a wonderful independent school north of Boston and I spoke to, the, to an evening meeting for the whole school and its surrounding community and one of the history teachers had asked one of the students to introduce me. And I thought, what a wonderful idea but the student had failed to practice and had failed to do this with his teacher. So instead of pronouncing it Appomattox, he called it something like, I don't know what it was, but it was really, <laughs> I was embarrassed for him, we were all embarrassed. It's the idea that, oh, students will say, oh, I don't need to practice. Oh, yes, we do, we need to practice. So Lincoln was one who practiced what he was going to say, spoke the word out loud, and then he got the sound of it. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Proposition. I will emphasize much more in our four o'clock presentation that Lincoln was in love with what he called the Saxon Bible. He didn't call it the New Saint King James Version. He called it the Saxon Bible. By that he meant it had strong, sturdy, one-syllable Saxon words. In the second inaugural, there will be 701 words, 505 are one syllable. But when we get to the word proposition, Senator Charles Sumner did not like it. The, Ma the English poet Matthew Arnold supposedly threw the address on the ground because this is a Latinate word. That's not the kind of language that's in the King James Bible. It's not the kind of language that William Shakespeare used. But I would argue, I think Shakespeare would too, that we need pepper with salt, and so there's a balance here. But the point is here. Thomas Jefferson had said that our country was based on self-evident truths, and Abraham Lincoln was in love with the Declaration of Independence when he came roaring out of his law practice after the uh, 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, he went back again and again to the Declaration and the self-evident truths. But here he's using the term proposition. What does he mean? I think he means that the American democracy is an experiment and the result of that experiment is not yet in. So I think he chose the word proposition very carefully. It's a proposition, it hasn't yet been concluded. It may not triumph, it is yet a proposition. Let me suggest that Lincoln characteristically in this address structures it as past, present, and future. So the first paragraph, which is just one sentence, is the past. This is the past. He's reminding us of our debt to our fathers. He's reminding us of our debt to the revolutionary generation. Then in the second sentence, he says, now. And suddenly he is signaling to the audience, now we're going to start talking about the present. Now we're in the present. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. This afternoon, I want to lift up some of the rhetorical strategies that Lincoln uses in a speech, especially when you don't have many words, only 272. He will take certain keywords, hear the word nation, and he will repeat it over and over and over again. Watch for what he does later today in the second inaugural, what key word he repeats over and over and over again.
And Lincoln usually, he's developing as a speaker, he does what I hope good speakers and good writers do, he does away with extra adjectives, with extra adverbs, but not this time. No, now we are involved in a great civil war. He wants to emphasize what that is. So conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Hold on to that word dedicated. That's an absolutely central, prominent word. And the question we're going to be asking today is where does that word come from? What does he draw it from? It relates to one of the questions we had at 11 o'clock. We are met on a great battlefield of the war. Lincoln also, and I don't have a, maybe I should have, but I don't have a screen or whiteboard or PowerPoint or anything like that, but Lincoln is a great person to use parallelisms. So we have a great civil war and we have a great battlefield. And that is another kind of invisible thread that the audience may not be fully aware of it, but it helps us structure our own listening and our own meaning. We have come to dedicate, my goodness there, that's word, that word again, a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives that the nation might live. We're still in the present. We're commemorating these men who gave their lives. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. And so up to this point in time, in a certain sense, Lincoln is doing what the lawyer had asked him to do, deliver a few short words just to sort of say, all right, we all know this is why we're here. But the moment that he enters the next paragraph, but in a larger sense, he is signaling to all of us that he's about to expand his purpose. He's not going to be content to simply say, well, let's give credit. Let's give praise to the men who fought here and the men who died here. He's now going to lift our eyes beyond. So I began to say earlier that if I'd have given a fourth lecture, it would have been that in the summer of 1863, when the nation, many parts of the nation were getting very tired of this war, there was a huge movement underway, led by the Democratic Party, to restore what they said the nation as it was, the nation as it was. Let's simply go back to 1860. There has been enough violence and blood. The nation as it was, of course, would mean let's stop emancipating the slaves. So they decided they would hold their the nation as it was rally. Where else but in Springfield, Illinois, Lincoln's hometown. Let's lay it to Abe. And they held it there in June of 1863. Well, the Republican Party knew they had to respond. So they planned their own rally for the first Saturday of September, and they invited Abraham Lincoln to come from Washington. And when one of the most difficult decisions of his life, he wanted to come, he so wanted to come, but he finally decided he couldn't come. It would take so long, he couldn't leave Washington to come to Springfield. When he did the Emancipation Proclamation, it emancipated some of the slaves, but not all of the slaves. And he didn't really imagine, there's been a huge debate in these four years of the commemoration of the Civil War. Was the purpose of Lincoln and the Civil War to save the Union, or was the purpose to save the Union and to free the slaves? My perception is the purpose was to save the Union, and the, and the freeing of the slaves became part of that saving Union, but not at the beginning. I do not believe that was Lincoln's intention at the beginning. But when the Emancipation Proclamation was declared, Lincoln thought that, well, perhaps if slaves freed African Americans could serve in the back of the line, this would re re release white soldiers to serve in the front of the line. But then Henry Stanton, Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, a prominent person in that movie, Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant began to observe what was happening, and they saw that black soldiers could fight with courage and with valor. Many people felt they had been so put down as slaves, they would never be able to fight, but they did. And as Lincoln prepared to think of what he would say at Springfield, Ulysses S. Grant wrote him a letter and said, I want you to know what these black soldiers are doing. So Lincoln couldn't come to Springfield, so what he did was he sent a speech to be read by a public reader. We used to have public readers. <laughs> They were people who could read the Declaration of Independence, who could read Washington's farewell address, who could read scripture in our church as well. And 50,000 people came to this little town of 10,000, Springfield, Illinois. 
And how could 50,000 people hear what Lincoln would say in a letter, that, written, a letter to Conkling? There were seven speaking stands. And in this letter, really a speech, Lincoln for the first time comes out clearly and, and, and values and, and praises the courage of the black soldiers. And even more than that, he puts down the whites who would go against this movement. Well, after that speech, someone said to him, you should look for another opportunity. The next time you get an opportunity, the opportunity comes at Gettysburg. And so he accepts it. I'm convinced he never would have accepted it. But several very important people said, look for the opportunity. It's hard to imagine, but I don't think Lincoln fully grasped how much his public speaking could be so energizing to a nation. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. Isn't that an interesting rhetorical strategy? We cannot, cannot, cannot. I think it may hearken back to Lincoln's work as a lawyer, where an astute lawyer often begins by conceding the point. I can't do this, or boom, boom, boom. But then he moves towards the positive point. Lincoln begins with a negative. Cannot, cannot, cannot. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. Lincoln's another rhetorical strategy is his use of antithesis. It heightens our imagination. Living and dead. Add, detract. And then this remarkable sentence. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Lincoln is really saying, in a sense, this most eloquent man, that words don't really matter. Now, I don't think he probably ever thought about this, but Edward Everett had just spoken for two hours and seven minutes. <laughs> two hours and seven minutes. And Edward Everett, who was kind of a prima donna, what he did was there was a table there on the platform at Gettysburg, and so he took out his massive manuscript and he put his manuscript on the table, which is a way of saying to the audience, I want you to know I've memorized every single word of it. And then he spoke for two hours and seven minutes, and he went through all the details of the battle. And the photographer now had arrived, and he was, photography had been invented only in 1839. It was quite a complex process. It took a lot of time and the photographer was getting ready to take the photograph of Edward Everett. And Lincoln makes this comment. The world will little note, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Again, the antithesis. What we say, what they did. Now, still in the present, but moving to the future. It is for us, the living, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Unfinished is the key word. He is really saying to the audience, it's not enough simply to dedicate this seminary. It's not enough simply to praise those who have fallen here. There is some unfinished work. And in, by saying that, in a way, the audience is, their ears come alive. Well, what is that unfinished work? What are you asking us to do? It is rather for us, it is for us the living to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. This is a long sentence. Often Lincoln writes very short sentences, but not this time. This is a long, final, 82-word <coughs> sentence that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, repeats that word, and then suddenly, he has a speaking text, he'd taken it out of his left, left pocket, he'd put on his spectacles, but suddenly he interjects something that's not in his speaking text, under God. It breaks the sentence, it breaks the grammar, but suddenly he says, under God shall have a new 
birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now, this is the great admired speech of Lincoln. If you go to the Lincoln Memorial, more people are looking at the Gettysburg Address than they are at the Second Inaugural. This is the supposed uh, best statement of Lincoln. Have we really taken the time to understand this language? For those of us gathered here this afternoon, I want to call our attention to these words dedicate, devotion, devotion, dedicate. Where does that come from? Well, the gentleman who asked the question this morning or made the comment was right on target. This is the language of the Second Great Awakening. This is the language of the 1858 prayer revival. This is the language that Lincoln was listening to. Phineas Densmore Gurley, the pastor at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, many of his sermons are at the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia. This is the thing what Lincoln was listening to. So what we have missed, again, is not that this is the second inaugural. There are not, a, there are not four uh, scriptural allusions here. But still, this is basically kind of religious language coming out of the Second Great Awakening. But it's very sophisticated. It's very layered. It's very nuanced. It's both political and religious at the same time. What do I mean? It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is for us, rather for us, to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. And the audience should be asking, what is that task? That from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Do you see the power of repetition? That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Well, those of us within the Christian faith know the language of the new birth. And I think Lincoln is here very, a very sophisticated way using both political and religious language. He had grown up in a generation which believed that slavery would become extinct by its own power. That yes, the Constitution did not really say anything about slavery, he knew that the framers, to get 13 colonies to become one nation, in a sense, passed on that issue. But I believe he had now discovered that he could no longer pass. There's a recent book out called Founding Father. It's good in its own way, but I think it, it, it goes way far, too far. It's making the point that Lincoln is sort of an originalist. He, all he wants to do is to repristine the Constitution. And although Lincoln is a man who loves the fathers and who is a lawyer that is in love with president, we fail Lincoln if we do not understand what he says in his annual address to Congress just before the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863, what we'd call the State of the Union Address. I love his words. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. So anyone who simply wishes to say that Lincoln only wishes to go back to bring to light the founders misses the point that Lincoln recognizes that as wonderful as those founders are, they passed on the issue of slavery and we can no longer pass on it, that this birth of freedom cannot simply include white people. And he's going to stand up now in those Lincoln-Douglas debates, we fail to remember that in the first two debates, Stephen Douglas called Lincoln a nigger lover 19 times. He called him a black Republican 21 times. And we've now, nine years ago, you wonder if anything new is being found. Nine years ago, a woman walked into the Abraham Lincoln bookshop in, in Chicago, Illinois. It's a great bookstore. Daniel Weinberg is the proprietor. And she said, I think, I think that I have a letter from Abraham Lincoln to my great-grandfather. Now this, I, people come into the Library of Congress or the Huntington Library all the time, and unfortunately this is usually not true. It's a forgery or it's a facsimile. And when Daniel Weinberg looked at it, he said, my goodness, it is a letter from Abraham Lincoln. We know the correspondence that went back and forth between Lincoln and her great-grandfather. 
And in it, Lincoln, in the fall of 1859, not thinking that he would become a candidate for president, says something to the effect, if the Republican Party does not nominate someone who is anti-slavery, it would be idiocy, idiocy. So Lincoln is strongly anti-slavery. This problem and question in the Civil War is what's the timing of that, how to keep four border states in. So now he's deciding that there is a new birth of freedom. He's going to expand the meaning of the American experiment, the American proposition. It must expand. It must include people it did not include at the beginning. Whether Jefferson meant this or not, that's another interesting question. But Lincoln is saying, when he says all men are created equal, that's what he means. Not socially, oh certainly not socially, that would not even been possible in the 19th century, but politically. But what I want to emphasize this afternoon is that this is also religious language. And you and I understand that the new birth, again, is this kind of strange, mysterious phenomenon where the old person becomes new, that somehow there is a new birth within us. It meant a lot more to join a church in the 19th century, believe me, than it does in the 21st century. A person usually had to give a narrative of that Christian experience, not necessarily of conversion, but some story that they would say of their own faith. And so the language of that is devotion, is dedication. And I think Lincoln very self-consciously is using that language in this Gettysburg Address. Under God, I guess I said already this morning that Lincoln could very well have edited that back out once he went and looked at the final copies of the Gettysburg Address. He did that with other addresses. Well, you, you, if you're a speaker or a preacher or a teacher, you've often maybe said something spontaneously. And said, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that. And, and in the final edition, you don't want to say that, and so it's taken back out. But Lincoln kept that in. And I think it gives it a different dimension, that, th that there's a power at work here in this nation. Lincoln really is affirming that the roots of this nation are both political and religious. We are not Australia, we were not founded by convicts, we were founded by Puritans. And however we want to deal with that today, Lincoln understands that both of those, both of those are the, are the roots of this nation. And so he's calling people now to go forward. Where does the language of by the people, for the people, uh, of the people, by the people, for the people, again there's been a big debate, we don't have any audio of Lincoln, was he saying of the people, by the people, no, I think he was saying of the people, people, people. He's emphasizing the community. Well, there have been suggestions that, that uh, this language perhaps comes from others, uh, forebears. Uh, Daniel Webster would be one uh, who, who, who used these words. Back to my image of the string of pearls, I think the real antecedent of this, these words is Abraham Lincoln. So in his first inaugural address, he says, the chief magistrate derives all of his authority from the people. When he called Congress together on the 4th of July, 1861, to get their authorization for the raising of troops for the Civil War, he speaks of a government of the people by the same people. Well, now the photographer has been trying to get Abraham Lincoln's in focus. He wants to get his photograph along with Edward Everett, but Lincoln's over. <laughs> and there's no photograph. Oh, there are a couple of photographs, we think, of Lincoln in the crowd, but the photographer was trying to get Lincoln delivering the, sec the Gettysburg Address, and he doesn't do it. And so the address is over. The papers the next day have already received Edward Everett's speech because he hands it out in advance, <laughs> and so it's all typeset, <laughs> it's all right there, but Lincoln didn't hand his out in advance, so the papers the next day are largely silent. We've had a myth that the address was not well received. Ward Hill Lamon, his law partner and friend who was the marshal that day, said 20 years later that Lincoln told him on the platform, this speech won't scour. I don't believe he said that for a moment. Lamon says a lot of things that really ended up not being very true. And there were some newspapers who understood instantly how powerful this was. Not the Times of London, this is nothing but the utterings of the village lawyer. Once again, the time of Times of London put down the lawyer, the village lawyer, and his speech. But the most remarkable commentator on the speech was Edward Everett. And now I want, if I can, to, to turn to something in my biography. 
I can't carry this around because it's too big. <laughs> Don't check my luggage. Shame on me. Right, 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 right. Uh, as Lincoln traveled from Springfield to Washington on his 12-day train, train trip, Edward Everett was listening, so to speak, to these speeches from his home in, in Massachusetts. And I found in uh, Edward Everett's diary, not in anything that he published, we don't want to publish things that we might be embarrassed about later, that Edward Everett wrote these words in his diary. These speeches thus far, he wrote on February 15, 1861, these speeches thus far have been of the most ordinary kind, destitute of everything, not merely of felicity and grace, but of common pertinence. And then Edward Everett concluded, he is evidently a person of very inferior cast of character, wholly unequal to the crisis. Three years later, almost three years later, they come face to face at Gettysburg. And after Edward has spoken for two hours and seven minutes, Lincoln gets up and speaks for two and a half minutes. But the next day, Edward Everett writes the most remarkable letter to Lincoln. Permit me to express my great admiration of the thoughts expressed by you with such eloquent simplicity and appropriateness. And then he says, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. Wow. So here we have a remarkable address. If we have studied it, or maybe if we've memorized it, we may think we know its content. I'm suggesting this afternoon that, yes, we may know its content, but especially here, I want to lift up again, I think, the deep religious language, not simply in the phrase under God, but the whole idea of dedication and devotion and new birth, that in a sense, Lincoln understood the Civil War as a ritual purification, that this nation, however great it is, needed to be purified of the sin of slavery, and that he understood that, both politically, but he understood the right and ritual of purification because of his own participation in the Christian church. When Fort Sumter was finally bombed, Lincoln went to church that Sunday morning, uh, February, uh, April 2000, 1861, and he heard his minister use some of the very words that he would use in the second inaugural address. The Gettysburg Address, it has so much to say to us. I'll conclude with this. In the first anniversary of 9-11, the people of New York looked for a way to, to commemorate that deeply violent feeling event. They looked for a poet or perhaps a politician who could give voice to their deepest feelings. In the end, they said the Gettysburg Address together it still speaks to us. Let's have your comments and questions.